All right, welcome back, guys. This is Yankees Unloaded, and we're coming to you after another series win by the Yankees. They're six this year. They're six and one. I'm Jake Ellibogan. He is Gary Sheffield Jr., and welcome to the show. Gary, how about Luis Heal? Nice bounce back. I mean, guy had seven walks, and then he uh, has a game like today. I mean, this is what you want to see, the development and everything. Only two hits, nine strikeouts. I was a happy camper. Jake, how different was that? seeing okay so i want people who didn't see this game and and maybe you did watch and didn't pick up on this but luis heel was intentionally dialing back his fastball you we're used to seeing we saw him pitch in arizona earlier this year and he was throwing 98 up to 100 miles an hour and you saw today there was a lot of 94s in there 94 95 and then when he get ahead of guys and that's when you started seeing 98 99 that's pitching and that's something that comes along with the development of young players. And I felt like that's really important because if Luis Heal can't put away guys and can't get ahead of guys in the count, he's not going to go more than three or four innings. And so you saw today he was able to give us more length because he was pitching. So I thought that was super important in terms of his individual development. But as far as how much that can help the Yankees, I mean, I can't even put it into words how helpful that is it's ridiculous it's invaluable i mean to have a what 25 year old coming off of tommy john rehab and look this good with like limited like let's be honest here limited mlb experience i mean he pitched it a little bit but not a ton and, and he also doesn't have a polished slider which you saw you saw yeah. a lot of the broadcast discussing how that slider at least right now doesn't Kinda have a ton like of depth cutter. it's more of a cutter yeah. And that pitch is going to develop. He'll probably tweak that pitch, get a little bit more depth, maybe work with Garrett Cole, some other guys. You see some other guys with big sweeping sliders like Rodon. I'm sure those guys will get in his ear at some point. And it's only a matter of time before that plus changeup that we saw today on display, full display. That oh, fastball yeah. command was a little bit better today. When he gets that third pitch in command, Luis Heal is a problem. He has like, and I said this before, he's got ace quality stuff. Yes, he know? does. And that's the thing. Like he may not reach that ever. And if, if he does, he may not reach it for another three years, but he has it, you know, he has it to the point right. where, you know, Garrett Cole, who's, you know, going to be what? 36, 37. By the time this guy turns 30, we could be looking at like a, you know, passing of the torch. If all goes well. And that gets me excited because, you know, you may say that, oh, the ground ball pitchers are boring or guys that just, you know, the efficient guys that don't get strikeouts are boring. This guy ain't boring. This this guy is must watch TV right now. When he's pitching like that, psh, that's, I mean, and the most important thing, and, and Boone brought it up in the post game is like, it's the evolution of his changeup. It's what is allowing him to really take that next step. So, yeah, and, and how about that fastball, by the way? So when he does rev it up, right, and it's 98, 99, he tends to miss up in the zone. Well, early in the count, if he's going max velocity and he's missing up there, players are not going to offer at that. But let yourself get ahead 0-2, 1-2. They've got the change up in the back of their mind, and then you rev up and go up there. That pitch early in the early in the count is not a competitive pitch. But when guys have two strikes on them, all of a sudden upper 90s because it becomes a dangerous pitch. And you saw today, players weren't necessarily able to lay off of it. He only had three walks. To, oh, he had three walks today. That's a huge step in the right direction. He was essentially walking a guy in inning, which is not good. And when you have this type of stuff and you can limit <coughs> walks, the pitch count's going to take care of itself. So right yeah. now, Luis Teal has a battle on his hands. How do I go about being a power pitcher while at the same time pitching and understanding that getting guys out in a way other than the strike zone can also still matter for this team? Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely disgusting that he can come out there, not give up a run because, again, it was, you know, unearned. Um, and, uh, you know, only give up two hits. And, you know, when you have that with yesterday's performance out of Cortez, and you got Cole waiting in the wings where he, you know, he's trying to get up to that level where he'll be good to go. You got Rodon who has shown us that he looks different than last year. You got Clark Schmidt, who, as long as you don't throw him against the, uh, the third time through the order, he looks dominant. His stuff's great. And then Stroman, who we were talking about is the ace of, 
you know, the pitching staff potentially earlier in the year. Um, I, I mean, they have one of the most efficient starting rotations in baseball. And what's funny is they're not generating a ton of wins either. It just goes they're to not. show you wins don't really matter. And no pitcher, no starting pitcher is going to sit there and be all upset that they didn't get the win. Maybe sometimes it'll happen. It is fun. Like you like to win, but you know, I thought today I thought, um, you know, Aaron Savali pitched really well up until that fifth inning. Um, He's it got went nasty stuff, man. He does. And this game went exactly how I expected, except I think I had four to two and I had okay. them getting through, through Savali, um, not through Savali. I thought they would, you know, torch their bullpen essentially, which I okay. guess, you know, they didn't really do in this series as much as I thought they would. Um, cause this is one of the, bu- the worst bullpens in the league, but at the same time, it kind of goes back to what you've said before. They got that four spot in the fifth inning. They were kind of on cruise control. I mean, at that point, yeah. they're up four one. This game kind of feels like, you know, four one is like maybe like eight to two. You know, well, so, I mean, why wouldn't you feel that way? I mean, we didn't expect Dennis Santana to pitch the way he pitched today. Obviously, he'd been yeah. pitching pretty well overall, and we really like the guy. All right, so yeah, I'll give um, him a pass said too, that because right, you know, he has one bad game. Okay, <laughs> it's like last episode, Caleb Ferguson's had his what third bad game in a row. You had yeah, to address the trend, about. which we did. Yeah. We did that on the show. We addressed how people pitch in the short term. And it's part of our jobs as podcasters to mention what someone did today. But also if we have a a big judgment on the guy and we think that something should be done, maybe someone else should get out there. Well, that person must've been bad for a consistent period of time before we made that judgment. And that's what we did with Ferguson. So, but having said that lineup wise, I thought the bottom of the lineup just did a fantastic job. Again, Trevino with a, another productive day driving in a run, your guy, Jake Sky, Oswaldo Cabrera he's with another stuck. two knocks. He's just been humongous for this team. And, you know, maybe when you're looking at a team right now, I would say the top of our lineup is just a big struggle bus right now. You've got Anthony Volpe, who's really not putting together very solid at bats. I'm sure he's going to come out of that. And like Jake said, as long as he doesn't revert back to his old habits, this is not a problem. This is just the ebbs and the flows of an offense. But having said that, Judge is also struggling. I know he had a hit today. He hit a ball hard on a breaking ball. That was good to see. But overall, he knows he's still on the struggle bus. And then Juan Soto, of course, was hitless today. So that happens in baseball. Juan Soto overall has been fantastic. Having said that, all of our damage came basically once we got to Rizzo in the lineup, everybody contributed offensively. And that's exactly what offenses need to buy time for guys like Aaron Judge and Volpe to get back right and be productive again. Yeah, and I think the the best thing about this day, once you you know, once you talk about heel, the best thing about this day is Verdugo going three for four. That's the guy you really want to start to emerge because he's somebody that can really help you out. He's a strategic hitter. He's trying to hit it, you know, opposite field. Um, you know, he's really not he's not against just sticking the bat out there. He's not home run or strikeout, you know, and I think when you have somebody like that cooking and now he's up to batting 260 on the year, which is around where he's probably going to finish for the year, I would imagine. And his K him. rate's below 10%, by the way, which is yeah. exactly what this team needed. It's exactly why they got him, you know? And so you look at the two RBIs, the three hits, and you know, then you have Trevino hitting well at the bottom of the order and Cabrera, who I'm going to say it again, like, I again, I understand, you know, yesterday he was batting sixth and it didn't make sense. And today it was more so what you were talking about, wanting him hitting ninth. It makes zero sense to not have Cabrera at the top of the lineup, in my opinion. Yeah, right I mean, that's that's totally fine and valid, right? right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's just a valid take because not and, and again, like this is you making that argument and not me. But right now, the Yankees have an understanding that if Volpe and Judge are struggling, well, we're going to have those two guys up there. We've basically got this safety net in our nine hitter to turn the lineup over. Well, yeah. that, there's an argument to be made that there is some effectiveness, and we're clearly, we saw it today, and that's that's great. But having said that, do I necessarily want a an Anthony Rizzo or a Glaber Torres, or I know Verdugo had three hits today, but would I rather see those guys up there as opposed to Oswaldo Cabrera? I just don't know the answer to that. To be honest with you, I'd probably rather see Cabrera right now. But, you know, 
long term, we're going to have to see how putting him ninth has an impact because at least in the short term, of course, you can draw conclusions and say it helped him today. But overall, I mean, there's some strong arguments to be made that he should be moving up. Yeah, and I want to shout out uh, Stanton because I thought he had a good day despite not putting the bat on the ball today in play. Um, those two walks, I mean, you know, once again, I think we're seeing a better eye out of Stanton than we've seen. And I think, you know, even though today, okay, the batting average goes down, right? It looks bad, but it really wasn't a failure. I mean, having those two walks, that's something that stood out to me, um, you know, and I just, I love seeing those walks go up, you know, I like seeing... Well, that set up the big inning, didn't it? I mean, we're yeah. talking about... People have to remember why we put up that crooked number. You don't put up crooked numbers with four, five, six hits in an inning. No, we had three walks consecutively and then three singles. That's how you put up crooked numbers. That's not something that the Yankees are accustomed to doing because usually over the years, the Yankees have had a system where they say, we are going to have a lineup of guys who can leave the ballpark. Well, a lot of times those guys are not putting the ball in play. Well, when you have a guy like Giancarlo Stan, who usually struggles with his strikeouts and he's deciding that, you know, taking a walk and setting up an at bat for a guy behind me, like Anthony Rizzo Rizzo today came through with a single. That's not much to ask from guys in run producing spots in your lineup. And when you can have guys pass the baton to qualified hitters who know how to drive in runs, it's going to lead to success. When we talk about the Yankees scoring runs consistently, we need to be able to consistently take walks. It just so happens every single time you watch the Yankees and they put up five, six, seven runs in a game, hell, even 10, you just so happen to look over at the stat sheet and see five walks. But then go, go see what happens when the Yankees fail to score. What are they usually failing to do? Not just hit, they're failing to walk. And that's why it's so important for have guys like Juan Soto, Guys like Judge swinging at strikes. Volpe right now struggling to swing at strikes. Very obvious. And long behold, now he's struggling. So once he gets back to swinging at strikes, swinging at quality strikes, this team's offensive. Essentially, what I'm saying is that they have a huge place to grow into. Huge shoes to grow into. And this Yankees team hasn't even scratched the surface of where they'll go. I agree. Um, I want to go back to the bottom of the first here, you know, the play by play against Savali. Um, I thought Volpe, his at bat, you could say it sucked, but I think just Savali knew how to neutralize Volpe right now. He knows, okay, he's not in the best state of mind right now. I'm going to just hit the outside corner and just pound that outside corner in three pitches that barely touched the black, essentially. And Volpe, you know, he fouled off the first one and then swung and missed on the other two. I thought that was just good pitching. And I think sometimes, it is. you know, what we, we fail to realize is that these are MLB hitters. What's considered good is, uh, you know, not even, you know how you get like your, your grades, right? Like in school and 65 is passing. That's not baseball. Passing it like two, you know, two and a half out of 10 times is passing, Right. I mean, really, when we think about it. So you're not going to do something every time you come to the plate. And in the case of Savali, first batter of the, the day sets the tone early on. I That really stood out to me. Like, I, I felt like, you know, obviously pitchers, they know their scouting reports and stuff like that. Like, he did his homework because Volpe has been swinging and missing on those pitches outside the zone. And he pounded them in a way where even if he took them, I think he was going to get the benefit of the call. So you have to swing at it because they were all three were strikes. They're all, you know, touching They're clipping the plate. Those so are the at bats was, where success shouldn't come. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You're kind of dead to rights when a guy has his, like sometimes a guy doesn't have his stuff and like he'll miss a location. No, no, no. Savali so wasn't missing on the first batter of the day. You saw it immediately His cutter, his sweeper, and then he hits you with your curve, uh, you know, strike you out. I mean, and that's another thing, dude, you talk about tunneling. Well, there you go. Like that, that was one of the hardest at bats, I think, all day uh, going up against Savali. Um, and then in that inning, you know, Soto gets the walk, right? Judge strikes out. He gave a seven pitch at bat, so I'm not going to get too much on him. I would like to see him, though, in these three, two counts. That's when Judge explodes. And I'm we're just not seeing that. And we're seeing actually a lot of strike looking like he took a sinker right down the middle. Um, you know, and then you have Stanton who walks who was in the a worse position. He starts down, uh, you know, one, two fouls off a pitch and then takes three balls that were like really close. 
And some would say like, yeah, okay, you know, yesterday's umpire probably calls it a strike or whatever. But I like that he was trying to make him work. Then you have Rizzo singling the center, which scores Soto. And then, of course, Torres strikes out and just not a really good at bat. But I thought, you know, obviously that run was so huge because that that led the game up until the fifth inning. That was the only thing that we had seen. And then going to the fifth inning, Gary, you know, Soto grounds out, right? Judge grounds out to shortstop. Stan walks four straight pitches. And I don't know how he took them, to be honest with you. They're right there. They're they're no different than Volpe's at bat. Well, um, I guess the question is, is that, yeah, how do you take those pitches because they're so close? But this is what Volpe can learn about hitting, and Volpe's going to be just fine. I know he will yeah, be. Yeah, of course he, he saw will. the type of player he is. But having said that, just because a pitch is close doesn't mean you should be close to swinging at it. And that's kind of what I said earlier when he was hitting, is it's not just he's swinging at strikes, he's swinging at quality strikes. When there's a pitch on the corner, that's not a quality strike to be swinging at. That's not a pitch you're going to be doing damage on. So when you come up to the plate five times, if you never saw a pitch all night that you could have handled, they pitched you pretty well. And if you watch today, Anthony Volpe did get pitches to hit. He was fouling a lot of those pitches off which is exactly the type of pitches that you see Aaron Judge essentially show his frustration, is the pitches that he's fouling off that he can handle. But when you're talking about backdoor sinkers and front door cutters, straight changeups, just flat out nasty pitches that you see all the time in Major League Baseball, great hitters still, for the most part, don't really do much with well-executed pitches. But when you do get a pitch, you need to be prepared for it. And I think that Volpe can definitely... You can probably see some frustration. He's not doing much with those pitches. Aaron Judge, same thing. I know today, like I said, he got a hanging breaking ball. He hit some really hard contact on it. So that was good to see. But overall, when you ask how Stanton can take that pitch, I think that's just being a professional and knowing that's not the pitch I can do anything with anyway. So you might as well go ahead and take that pitch. You might get a call, and it did. And now Rizzo comes up, gets a mistake, and they pay. Yeah. Exactly. And that was that was the turning point of the game, because at that point, it's one one. Um, the balk happened. I know there were people complaining about it. It's the right call. It, it, I mean, it's the right call. You have to step off backward, not, you know, to the side. And it was frustrating. I mean, it, I think we can all agree there. Yeah, I mean, it's, fr- it it's frustrating and it doesn't always get called, by the way. That's another thing I want to point out. Balks are very uncommon. It doesn't mean that guys don't t- technically balk every game. There's all there's going to be a balk every game, but it just doesn't always get called. Well, that Nestor Cortez fake throw was a balk. I don't know what the hell that was. Yeah, no, that was that was that was just so atrocious. And I And I know technically this is a Yankee, so I'm supposed to say that <laughs> nothing my team does is illegal and then everything everyone else does is but yeah um, you're absolutely correct i mean they just it, no, it that seems was... like a crap shoot when they decide they're going to yeah. call box and that just seemed like one of them yeah and i, I think they go into the game like i want to call it Bach. you know what i mean <laughs> right. like these yeah. guys it's funny i was just having this conversation with my father and it's like nfl officiating might be even worse but NFL officciating, you don't get the God complex that you get with umpires. Umpires Did you see literally how freaked out he was on the call today. Dude, what on earth is wrong with this dude? Like, I, I mean, these home plate, and I think it's home plate umpires, right? Like the guys that are, you know, if you're a first base or th- whatever, like you still can have an edge, I guess. But home plate umpires act like you are like they're the gods of destruction and you're in their universe. And it's like I do something and and like I'm I'm in the right no matter what I do. Don't you get that someone God said, complex from them? Yeah, it's, I get that. But someone said, well, he was right. So so obviously he's going to be demonstrative. And and this is what I say to that. We're all human beings. We all think all the time that we're right. And, and I know yeah. everyone likes to believe that they're all accountable and they can be told they're wrong. Go and speak to the average person and see how often when they give you a their heart of heart opinion about exactly what it is that they took in from a situation, no matter what that is, they're going to tell you, no, I think I'm right. Even well, if, what if the umpire's wrong, like, you're actually wrong. Like even yeah, if there's a hundred percent, 
like I can back up why you're wrong. Yeah, that's just the way people are. The but the problem with the umpires, like and especially the people that grandstand umpires like that. My issue is that umpires are wrong more often than not. That's just the nature of the business is that it's a human thing. You're not going to be right more often than not. You're going to be wrong more often than not. It's a tough job. I get that. My issue and the reason why they have such a target on their back is because of that God complex they carry. Have you ever seen a home plate umpire not throw a fit for somebody talking about... I mean, dude, they're so mentally soft. They'll toss, they'll toss a manager out of a game before he's even come out and argued. Like, I remember when Boone looked at the guy weird, right? They, they showed the replay. They're like, like Michael K. It was like two years ago. I was like, did Boone actually like say anything? It's like Boone just, you know, gave him like the daggers, gave him the you death know what stare. This proves? Jake, this is what this proves. And this is why MLB umpires actually, in my opinion, shouldn't exist. <laughs> when people say, well, Boone might not have done something right then. However, he was Boone's going. hounded this guy before. Oh, okay? my God. Stop you right there. Aaron Boone or any other person in Major League Baseball, player or manager, that comes into a game and an umpire has a preconceived judgment on that person and changes the way that he's going to call the game. They shouldn't that be subjectiveness has to be out the game of baseball. I know the home plate umpires by name, first and last name, every night. I don't want to know them. Yeah. They can be a good person. They can be pretty solid at the job. But when I watch you be emotional about a call that you're delivering and your explanation as well, Trevino's been down my back all night and then he complained about the call, so I matched his energy. There's no matching to be done. I don't need you to match anything. No one's going to Trevino's the stadium to watch job. you. No. Trevino has a... Remember, if this call goes any other way, it directly impacts... Trevino's job and yeah. also impacts whether or not he's the money he's making for his family. No umpire, regardless of their performance, is going to lose their job. We've established this. Exactly. So why are you as fired up as the players? And I need that explained to me. And I'm sure Boone and everyone else with Major League Baseball would love to hear how umpires are taking it so personally that people whose livelihoods depend on the game are complaining about calls that are subjective. I don't understand that. I know. I have always believed in having respect for the umpire. Like I was raised that way, um, playing baseball growing up, and I always went that route. But I get why people snap. And, it, you know, it's up to the umpire to diffuse these situations. And I feel like they make them worse more often than not. I think, you know, when you saw... Like we talked about on the show a while ago, Kyle Schwarber, when he freaked out at Angel Hernandez, like that was, he didn't defuse that situation. Angel Hernandez said something to set him off. He and went then, berserk. And then he went berserk the next at bat. <laughs> That's what people don't, they don't see that. The, the right. at bat before, Angel Hernandez said something to him like, well, you could swing at it or, or something like, and then he, he looked at him like this. And then the next at bat, he calls a pitch way outside the zone and way low, and he just lost it. And look, again, uh, you know, I don't like NFL officiating. I don't like NHL officiating. No one likes really any officiating. I mean, the NBA refs are annoying too. But are they, do they have a God complex? Do we really see, like, while we're watching TV or we're at the games, do they look like they're standing above you? Like, bro, like the way umpires look in baseball, home plate umpires specifically, they act like they're better than everyone. And so, you know, the good news, though, the good news about this is that in the NFL, here's the difference. And this is the beauty of baseball mm -hmm. is that a lot of the calls, maybe not box, but balls, strikes and who's out at what base and who's safe is not subjective. The strike zone should be an objective zone. It should. And yes, you can argue that that is an adjustment based on the history of the game. However, when the game is becoming harder to call, whether it be increased velocity, increased spin and movement, whatever that reasoning is, we need to agree that we have the technology now to make this an objective part of the game. Obviously, baseball struggling with injuries, struggling to keep guys on the field. We can't be struggling with both that and 
how do we call this game? The NFL oh, yeah. has a situation on their hands where people complain all the time about officials. However, everything about that game is subjective. There's no defined hold. There's no defined pass interference. It's subjective. Did that call, did he hold him and say that impacted his ability to catch the ball? One person might watch that and say, I don't think it impacted him. I think he sold it a little bit. And then another person says he tackled him. Those are two different perspectives on the same play. But baseball, when you're watching a pitch go into a floating zone in the strike zone, you say, huh, two people with two different opinions are going to tell you the same thing. Oh, yeah, that shit was a strike. Obviously, but they missed it. And then the only two opinions you can have about baseball is that one person likes the fact that subjectively the guy missed the call. It's part of the game and the other does not. So we have to decide, do we want to change this game into a more objective game of baseball or do we want to continue with this big circle jerk of umpires? Because if it's that, then I guess we can just stop complaining about it and just acknowledge that you know, hopefully we're not on the losing end of one of these calls because I would hate for that to happen. I would love this game to become more about the players and less again about umpires. I agree. Very well put. I think with the the K zone, it's almost insulting of our intelligence because we know what a strike is. We're watching it and then they're like, that's a ball. And they're like, what? <laughs> that just blows the top off of the concept of everything that I know about a strike zone. But that's I right. also think that they basically get away with it because they'll just say it all balances out in the end. Bro, I don't care. I want it right. I don't care if it eventually you're going to get it wrong. That just, you know what that tells me when people say that? It means that they're okay because, oh, this team got screwed this night. Well, they'll get screwed another night. I don't want anybody getting to screwed. Me. Yeah, and then they'll complain to us about it. Yeah. We're we're Yankees podcasters, okay? Yeah. We're, we're our job and I'm not saying that one... the Rays got any, you know, special right. treatment today. This is just generalization of umpires, essentially. Three weeks from now, we can be in Tampa, and the same home plate umpire, John Lipka, could be behind the plate, and we could see Aaron Judge take a bases loaded, three one pitch right down the middle and call it ball four because the guy thought it was low. And sure enough, we would be talking about automated strike zones, except the people who were fine with it this week. We'll have a problem next week. That's yeah. the problem. Everyone situationally and anecdotally decides how important this topic is to them. And we on this show have been very consistent in games that we've won 10 to two. We've talked about the umpires. Catchers interference. At the very least, we've touched on again. It. <laughs> yeah, we do it. He we win. It. We Guys, still talk about how bad it is. Nobody loves Gary. No, nobody loves catchers interference more than Gary Sheffield Jr. <laughs> It's so obscene. It's, he, nothing was done to get to first base. The dude literally, <laughs> I, I don't have a bat with me. I was looking for this freaking bat. He literally goes like this and check swings. No part of him. He was just taking a pitch right down the chute. It was an out. And Trevino's just catching a ball. He didn't even really need to frame it. It was, it was strike three. And he tips his glove and he goes, oh yeah, see, you impeded his ability to strike out right there. So first base and I personally just because I complain about something doesn't necessarily mean I have the perfect solution because I don't think that's true I don't know what the perfect solution is for that I'm sure there's an overhanging solution that someone's thought of somewhere who's been very creative but that doesn't make sense that you can just check swing o2 hit it off someone's glove to which our own personal broadcast says our own player in Jacoby Ellsbury, he used to he used to just do it all the time, and we used to say, "Why don't they just do it on purpose?" The fact that you can do something on purpose that doesn't involve hitting the ball or taking a ball and saying, "Oh, I, I had a good eye, so I got to first base." No, you can just slap the catcher's glove and get over to first, which is cheating. Like, I mean, what? That's not baseball. I mean, at some no. point or another, we have to acknowledge the elephant in the room in certain calls in this sport and acknowledge that it's not of the sport. Well, and I mean, it's the same thing. Like, what I don't understand is, why can't we have some sort of, like, launch monitor? You know, why do we? Why are we so... It's 2024. Like, why do we need first base and third base umpires to decide whether or not a guy broke 
the plane essentially it's a strike you know on the on the check swings i don't know why we can't just have like a radar that detects that you or know? how about the umpire who's behind home plate that's supposed to be telling me and selling me on the idea that he's looking at where the pitch went and then simultaneously he can look out the side of his eye and say you know what yeah yanni diaz he swung right there yes he did he just makes the decision right there on his yeah. own yeah well that's and not then- of human The reason why I brought up check swings is because we do the same thing with check swings. Like it's, Oh, did he go? And I always look at it and I'm like, dude, I don't even know if a guy goes or not. I mean, at this point, the way like the broadcast, even the yes broadcast sometimes surprises me for like the other team be like, all right, that guy clearly looked like he went and they're like, ah, he didn't go. And I was like, bro, his bats all the way out here. What is not going? I, I don't feel like we even know what a check swing you know, a strike or a ball really is. It's and pretty so, much that call and then running in the first base path. Do you remember that call they used to do all the time? Uh, You'd run down the first base line. The catcher wouldn't clear. He would throw it straight into your runner, right into his back. And they'd say, <laughs> oh, damn, he ran into the base path. I go, where the hell's the base path? I know. Show it to me. It's, yeah. And I guess, like, my thinking is the way we, and I think it's not entirely perfect. Like I said, I think we needed to use like a radar or something to decide whether or not a guy goes or not. Um, But why isn't it that we, we look at like catchers interference like that. So the whole point of the check swing, did he go is how egregious is the swing, right? That's essentially what it is. How egregiously did he turn? Why aren't we doing that with... Because there was something that helped the Yankees this year where he hit a a lace on the glove. That's not egregious. I wouldn't give him a, a call. But if you're like right. literally hitting the entire glove, okay, now that just affected my swing. I think it should be something like that. I think it should be a judgment call based on... And you. it should be like anything that's close like that, you just put your finger up or whatever, they review it. And if you're like your bat hits like the whole glove or it looks like it really impeded the swing, not hitting a lace. You have an argument. You also need to, in some way, shape or form, you know, make it. So if a guy's starting his swing where he realizes I have no chance at this, I'm just going to, and it doesn't look like a natural swing that should actually count as a strike against the batter. I mean, you would like that to be the case, but I'm sure. And it's part of our jobs is to extend an olive branch to the other side of the argument. And Jake, I'm sure there's going to be people who say, well, even hitting a lace on the glove is enough to impact someone's swing to the point where the sweet spot of the bat and then just completely missing the ball. It's so minuscule, the difference and hitting someone's glove marginally could impact that. Now, I guess you could make that argument, but overall, that's a better way to go about the call as opposed to the way we're doing it right now. Because yeah. the way we're doing it right now it is right. just assuming that if you even freaking scrape this thing, that they act like the catcher didn't even give you a damn chance to hit the ball. That's just not what we're seeing. And to be awarded first base after that happens, when nothing prior to it set up that reward, that's where I think we have a problem, Jake. I think we agree. Like That's our issue is when you're talking about marginal contact at best and then rewarding somebody with first base, which should be very hard to accomplish, it just doesn't work. So yeah, long story short, that's got to be fixed. Um, I'm sure it will be at some point or another. This game is changing a lot. I mean, this game has, I mean, we've put different bases in. We've decided that the game needs to be pitched quicker, right? There's a ton of different ways. We got rid of spider tack which is a whole nother issue for pitchers. So this game's changing a lot. And at the very least, I think we all can agree. Rob Manfred is pretty much atrocious. Oh, he's but worse. that said, at the very least, the wheels are spinning and he's kind of on his way out. So we'll, we'll see how the game changes. Well, and just to kind of wrap up that thing that we were talking about, you know, the argument for the baseball purists is what they call them is like, well, you know, this is part of the game and you don't want to change it because it's not like, you know, Ted Williams had the advantage that Aaron judge would have if, you know, he has an automated strike zone. And I'm like, we're already past that point. We're putting runners on second base that didn't actually earn to be on second base because we want to hurry up extra innings. Like we have RBIs that aren't actually like real RBIs. We have runs that aren't real runs already in the stat book. 
It's pretty fair. Like, I don't really see how anyone could argue against that because factually, <laughs> statistics are changed. Like anybody who's trying to compare today's statistics to yesterday's, I mean, I'm sorry, we've already we've crossed that boat. It is completely, it is not comparable at all. And like you mentioned, there are different things now. Stolen bases. I mean. There's bigger bases. To me, that's an advantage. Like, I'm more impressed with Ricky Henderson did. If anybody were to ever get to where Ricky Henderson is, which will never happen, but if never. anybody gets there, I will just say, well, they have bigger bases. And people will be they like, also oh, have it's unlimited a minuscule different. Yeah, that's they it. They had unlimited, unlimited pickoffs against Ricky Henderson. So we he saw today, more. Luis still picked off twice, and they said, yeah. all right, well, he's either got to pick him off or he's got to go to first base. Otherwise, it's a balk. Well, I'm fine if those are the type of rules that you're bringing in. But again, it's not apples to apples comparison. The game exactly. is already we've opened that Pandora's box. Once the game is changing to some degree. Yeah, you can't just be like, well, I'm a baseball purist. Like if you turn on a game from 1998 or hell, go go watch an 04 Yankees game. And the tell DH me that it's is like remotely in the both same leagues now. Like you're the not a baseball, changed. you can't be a baseball purist. There's no such thing anymore. Like there's already been too many changes. If, if you don't want there to, honestly, I'm just going to say this and, and put it to bed. If you are against an automated strike zone at this point, then simply put, you're against technological advancement and you are just being contrarian. That's all it is. You want to be different. There's no logical explanation to be like, I want human error. I want things to be wrong. I want teams to be screwed. No, you're just a contrarian and that's, that's fine, I guess. But you know, I, that's just how I look at it. I think there's already been way too much added to the game. That's not me hating on it, by the way, but there's right. been way too much added to the game where your argument now of, well, it's not fair to the people who used to play back in the day. Uh, we're way past that. <laughs> it, it, we are way past that. The advantages today are way, it, it's not even, it's not even close. So um, moving on to the last two things I want to talk about here. Um, the turning point that we were talking about in the fifth inning, uh, you know, having those three walks on Savali, that really rattled him. I think Stanton walking rattled him. Rizzo battling him to a nine pitch at bat rattled him. And then Torres walking was huge. Okay. Um, after that, the base is loaded. Verdugo comes up. He knocks in two uh, with the off the bat to the, you know, right field, uh, you know, to right field. Trevino had a nice single um, to center field, scored Torres. And then Cabrera. And it's funny, dude, because I wasn't sure why Cabrera was swinging at that. But, man, he really wanted that pitch. I mean, it was high. It was up yeah. there. But he's like, no, nah, that's mine. I'm going to go and get it. And he did. And, you know, that was pretty much all she wrote or so we thought. And then all of a sudden, you know, and again, we're not going to get too much on him, uh, you know, but happens. I mean, yeah, you know, they put in Dennis Santana thinking this game's pretty much done. It's 5-1. You're in the driver's seat. And Santana you know, gives up three and now it's five, four and our guy, our buddy, Victor Gonzalez comes in and, uh, it makes you feel, I, I don't know if you felt how I did, but if Victor Gonzalez pitched the 10th yesterday, uh, you know, they probably win that game. I'm just going to, it might be a you. different situation, but by the way, can I put a spotlight on one player? And I know that yeah. a lot of people probably aren't really thinking of this player because overall he's just been not very good. And it is Glaber Torres. Glaber Torres has been struggling. He's been hitting a buck ninety-five. He came in hitting a buck ninety-five in today's game. And towards the middle of the game, he fouled a pitch off his shin. And for anyone who watched that, you That's easily terrible. could argue that he had no business in the game based on the type of contact we saw. Obviously, we saw DJ LeMahieu go down with a broken foot earlier yeah. this year on essentially the same play. Now, having said all that. Glaber Torres easily could have just said, I'm in significant pain. I'm not hitting well. Get me off the field. And for me as a former baseball player, I can tell you it's much easier to come off the field when you're not feeling right and you're struggling. And Glaber Torres shockingly stayed in the game. I couldn't believe it. It looked like he could put no weight on his leg and decided that he was going to try and grind out a net bat. 
and he ended up striking out. But later in the game, he put forward one of the best at-bats of the game. So he didn't quit on this game, where this game, frankly, wasn't looking great. It didn't really look like much was happening. But I think that a commitment to not focusing on our results and what we're doing, I'm hitting 180, I was hitting 350 last week, but now I'm hitting 288 like Volpe is, no. How do we go about the next at-bat? How am I going to put forward a professional at bat? You mentioned earlier, Giancarlo Stanton. Again, and not to jump around here, but look at the rest of the roster. Yeah. they. You mentioned some guys played well today who had no hits. They didn't have a hit today. They walked twice, and one of the best things they did was take a close pitch, a close cutter off the plate. That's the best thing you did today? Yeah. Yes. That's the best thing that baseball. some players have to do that day, and it helps us win and put up crooked numbers. So I think Glaber Torres cannot be glossed over today because just because like he didn't have four hits today and hit a bomb in the into the porch. No. He was a professional baseball player today and he was a big reason why we won. Yeah, and you could build off these games. And I'm sure Glaber knows that. I think he's going to have a really good May, Gary. I think he I is going so. to smoke May. And I got to say, I mean Today, once again, you know, perseverance. I mean, five, all five runs, two out RBIs. That's what you love to see. Four, four for nine with runners in scoring position today, Gary. Four for nine. And that's with Judge only having one hit, right? Soto not having a hit. Volpe not having a hit. I mean, four for three nine errors. with runners. Yeah. Well, the errors. Okay. So the errors are a little misleading. Um, it was the, the catcher's the- interference ridiculous and then they have uh the heel throw and then they have the weaver catch um which i'll say this i gotta give luke weaver a lot of credit i know yeah he had an error but um he's pitched well since we got on his back you know and yes, he, he, he remember i said he you know him and uh caleb ferguson were separating themselves as like by far the worst guys in the bullpen well now caleb yeah. ferguson's on that island and if he doesn't you know watch it especially if Luke Weaver's going to bounce back now. He's alone <laughs> there. Like he he is the only one that I pretty much don't want to see on the mound at all. I'm fine bringing up Jake Cousins again just because I, I would just rather see Jake Cousins if they're going to give up three runs, I'd rather see a guy with better stuff. And see there, look at the timing of when Weaver came into the game. Luis Hill comes out the game, he's at a jam. They bring in Weaver, but the intention was that Weaver was going to come out for the 7th. That is how you manage a game. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Yes, like you can always say someone should have come out earlier, later, whatever it is. But where I don't want to argue is the order. If there's a guy who used used consistently with success for multi innings, don't bring him out in the eighth inning and then tell me the closer's coming out and Clay Holmes. That makes no sense. The yeah, player who's no. proven that he can be the setup man for this team is Victor Gonzalez and Ian Hamilton. Those two players are the guys that I say, yeah, I'm comfortable with that guy coming in and throwing one inning, one yeah. shutdown inning. But the guys who need to come out there and are going to give us multi-innings, maybe when Garrett Cole's back, you can say Clark Schmidt's going to be one of those guys to give us multi-innings, and Weaver, and then we talked about Beater at the beginning of this year. So the Yankees have more options, in my opinion, than what they lead to believe in terms of innings out the bullpen, but we need to make sure that they're used the way they were today because that was excellent. That, I thought this was another really good, you know, we get on Boone for some things. This is a really good day by Boone. I thought he managed this game really well. thought the lineup looked really good. I mean, I would love to see, you know, Austin Wells getting at bats. But I mean, if Trevino is going to keep hitting well, again, it's not me hating on Trevino. When Trevino wasn't pr- producing results, that was when I was talking. If he's going to hit 243 the whole year, he can start for all I care. I want the best players on the field, you know. And the thing is, Wells has time. You don't need to rush Wells. You know, Wells was playing at the end of last year because of how bad they were. So they were giving those kids an op- opportunity, essentially. But Wells doesn't have to be rushed, you know? So if Trevino's going to hit like that, by all means, I just want the best players on the field. So those are my thoughts, Gary. Uh, wrapping this thing up tomorrow um, on a Monday, we got the A's. And uh, 
you know, I want to get your thoughts on that game because it's at 105, <laughs> of course. Um, but also, there is an interesting little uh, pitching matchup there. J.P. Sears going against his former team. Um, I watched Sears' last start, actually, when before they traded him. And, uh, you know, at the stadium. And um, he's going up against Carlos Rodon, who, you know, Rodon, I think, was unfairly given two runs onto his ERA. Uh, I think he's pitched way better than his, you know, stats would indicate. Um, last time out, you know, maybe it was a little rocky for him. You know, I, I think he probably wanted, you know, a better outing. But I think he's going to shove tomorrow. I, I really, I think Rodon at the stadium... I think he's going to shove tomorrow. I, I think that um, I think Sears will pitch decently well. I got the Yankees in a six-three ball game. Okay, I mean, let's be real. Rodon's stuff was freaking ridiculous. His last start. So the fact that he got those two runs tacked onto his ERA, and and I know we don't really harp on ERA the same way we don't harp on wins. And as long yeah. as Rodon has his stuff and he's pitching consistently, same with, uh, right, like Clark Schmidt. I mean, the list goes on with our rotation. If they're pitching with the eye test the way we know they can, yeah, the ERA stuff doesn't matter. But if Rodon has his stuff that he had from his last start, Oakland didn't stand a damn chance. And by the way, J.P. Sears is a much better pitcher than I think people remember. He was very good for the Yankees when we dealt him. So, Absolutely. yeah, I'm... I wouldn't be surprised at all if he hangs tough. I know the Yankees kind of do some funky stuff. We're going to need some performance out of John Carlos Stan, who should be a lot more comfortable left against left-handed pitching. Yeah. I'm looking for John Carlo to make his mark on this series early. And so as long as guys like Anthony Volpe, uh, again, guys like Cabrera, um, Torres, where they actually have plate discipline and don't try to force the issue, Learn from Juan Soto. Oh, oh, every 0 for 3 night is not all the same. You need to be swinging at good strikes. And as long as they're doing that, they should be able to make some quick work at JP Sears. So I'm looking forward to this series. And hopefully some guys in this lineup that aren't necessarily getting those results can see some right now. Yeah, I mean, and this is a team like, look, we, we know, you know, the storyline behind them right now. We know that their fans aren't going to the games because the ownership is awful. Um, but we also know that this team is is fighting every night. You know, not a lot of talent, but they're still fighting every night. They're eight and fourteen, um, which is really not bad considering you know the lack of talent on the roster. But I mean, they have some guys that can you know put the ball in the seats. I mean, especially Langoliers, who has four homers on the year. So um, you know, their catcher. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but I'm not worried about this series at all. I got to be honest with you. Um, they'll probably win three of the four but I wouldn't be surprised that they sweep the series. Yeah, and I'd love to do it because as you see, Baltimore won again today. They're, they're winning baseball games, and Baltimore is at the very least solidifying that they're going to be at the very least a mid-90s win team, and we're going to have to go yeah. match that straight up. That's well, just, that Baltimore that's, series is coming in two weeks, I think, so that's right. going to be huge. That's, gonna, that's where boys become men. Yeah, is, is what we'd like to say. So I'm looking forward to that, but I want to make sure we take care of business and get some momentum going because if we can build some form of a lead going into that Baltimore series, I think that'll really help us mentally going into it. I'm not exactly sure if that's in Baltimore or New York. I'm sure you know, but it's going to be interesting. Uh, it's in Baltimore. It's in Baltimore. So it's going to be a tough series. It is. And the Yankees I know got we, some tough well, stuff ahead because they got yes. the Brewers too. You know? surprisingly playing well because i think yelich is playing pretty well and of yeah. course they got rid of burns and sent him to baltimore well people thought that milwaukee was just Devin gonna williams, die yeah Devin williams also gone right now so the fact Milwaukee's that milwaukee's 14 and 6 game, i mean it's very impressive yeah they're yeah and i mean you know they're going to be playing um milwaukee friday through sunday right on the road so after this oakland game you're getting back to back you know, decent. I mean, you you got seven games on the road. That that Baltimore series is massive. That's a four game set at Camden Yards. So we probably want to get out of there playing five hundred ball between those two series. To be honest with you, that really wouldn't be terrible. I think that if we set it up by taking care of business with a sweep in Oakland, that'll change how we view that five hundred. Yeah, I mean, I think four and three out of those seven games 
That's yeah. that should be if you win four of the seven, you're gonna feel good. Um oh, be great. Then you have Detroit though. Like at the stadium, who they're playing well. Okay. And then you have Houston, who's not playing well, but they're gonna want their vengeance. You know, it's at Yankee right. Stadium. Then you have, you know, at the oh God, Tropicana. Um, then you have Minnesota in Minnesota, then you got Chicago and Seattle. So, I mean, it, it, it lightens up. We can definitely say that, but I think those that Milwaukee Baltimore series is massive. Like I, I really believe those seven games, you know, this is when, Hey, if you're not ready for those and say they, they only won one of those games. I mean, now all of a sudden you're looking at a team that's barely in the playoff race. I mean, at that point, you know, they'd probably be in the wild card at that point. That's right. So, that's how important these games are. And it gets a long season. I get that. But sometimes if you lose pace, like momentum is real in baseball in the games and outside of the games. And 100%, you know, we've seen it, man. And we saw it, you know, when they didn't finish the job, despite the fact they, you know, they outplayed uh, Cleveland. They lost that final game, um, obviously, because Caleb Ferguson's blown save. But, uh, they lose that final game of the series and they go into Toronto and they are just dead in the water. I mean, it didn't even look like the same team. We talked about uninspired baseball. We then should have they, been swept in that series as well. Yeah. And then they, they win that game, uh, you know, the final game against Toronto six, four, which is huge. They shouldn't have even won the game. They had to come back and steal it. Then they go into the Tampa series and you could say, okay, well they didn't just sweep them. Sure. They very well could have. And, I saw better baseball being played. And I think a lot of that had to do with how they finished the Toronto series. Most definitely. So yes. I don't know if it's the same with Oakland. Like, I don't know if you win three in a row and then you lose like four game series is a little different, but I think a three game set, if you were to like win the first two in Milwaukee and you lose like the last game, I could see them sleepwalking going into Baltimore. It's just the way baseball I can is. See that. I'm trying to take four in this series. I I understand oh, that absolutely. it's the way baseball goes. There's upsets every day. It's not just every once in a while. So these are gimmies it's just, on the schedule. It's a game, but when you have these games on your schedule, especially yeah. given the context of who's coming next, you got to take care of business. So let's go absolutely. dominate this series. After we dominate these fools, then we'll go play Baltimore and go see where we where we stack up because Baltimore is a great team that oh, we of has. course respect. So we need to go in there with some type of lead so that we can we can spar a little bit. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. I Yeah, they really need to take care of business because, I mean, Baltimore's going to get those games against Oakland. So it's not like we're, yeah. oh, yeah, the Yankees only got them. They got the lucky. No, because Baltimore's going to have to play these teams too. And if That's Baltimore's right. winning those games and you're not, that could be the definition of who decides – the AL East at the end of the year. It's the same conversation as the Yankees, like maybe in 2017, 2018, where we just took care of Baltimore all year. Yeah. And people said, well, those games don't count. I said, well, we won 105 games. What'd you win? Yeah, so, exactly. I don't they remember caring about that. They add up quick, right. man. Think about how yes, quickly this adds up. They're 15 and seven right now. Yeah. They're going to be at 19 wins if they win the next four games in a row against a bad Oakland team. 19 and seven. It's I mean, right there for the taking. I think we will. That's really good. So, you know, but anyway, those are our thoughts. Guys, be sure to uh, like, subscribe, comment. Definitely drop a comment. Uh, we love answering those. And uh, be sure to follow us on social media at JK Bogan, at Gary Sheffield Jr., and at Yankees Unloaded. But that's it for us tomorrow, 105 Eastern Time. They got Oakland. We'll have another, you know, recap, of course. And uh, we'll see you guys then. And like this video.